God provides salvation from sin through faith in Christ alone. This is what we will study in this episode of Through the Word. Hi, I'm Adam Burton. I'm the pastor at Central Baptist Church in Maysville, Kentucky. Every Thursday, I release a new Bible study that comes from the Gospel Project, where we go chronologically through the entire Bible to see how all of Scripture points to Jesus. You can watch Through the Word on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and our website at cbcmaysville.com. You can also subscribe to the Through the Word audio podcast in your favorite podcasting app. Well, are you ready? Let's study the Bible. Many television shows and movies portray a common theme in a variety of scenarios. One plot shows a wholesome teen skipping school to hang out with a bad influence and eventually engaging in an activity that threatens her good reputation. In another, an adoring husband continues to laugh off the innocent flirting with of his co-worker who eventually kisses him. Yet in another, a humble man, full of integrity, but with a failing business, unknowingly accepts a loan that implicates him in crimes he took no part in. And in spite of the variety, you still find yourself yelling at the screen for the same reason. Like the teen refuses to confide in her understanding parents and ask for help. The husband fails to explain the situation to his wife as soon as it happens. The business owner decides against consulting the board of his company and and the authorities, even though he has clear proof of his innocence. Instead, these characters ignore the problem or try to cover it up, which ends up making the situation far worse than when it began. You know, why do people try to cover up their mistakes? rather than admit them and and seek help. Well, we are ashamed of our our failings and poor choices. We are not trusting of others to understand, to forgive, or or help. Or we think we can take care of the problems on our own and save ourselves the embarrassment. You know, in each scenario, the truth is the only thing that has the power to set things right. In the same way, but on a much greater scale, only faith in the finished work of Christ, has the power to free us from our sin and reconcile us to our Creator, ignoring our need for reconciliation by trying to conceal our wretched estate with good works only makes our situation worse, propelling us deeper into our sin and dragging us further away from God. In this study, we will explore the relationship between the law and faith as it pertains to sin. The distinction between the two, their functions, and their overall purpose will be examined. Exploring the history of the law will result in a deeper understanding of it and aid in clarifying where justification for the sinner and freedom from sin are found. We will uncover how the work of Jesus on the cross informed the faith of the people of God before the crucifixion even took place, and how that in turn informs the faith of Christians today. Here's our first point. Faith in Christ, not the law, is what justifies the sinner. Read with me Galatians chapter 3 verses 1 through 6. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing both faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, as sinful human beings, you know, we are prone to to be fickle and foolish. We can call we can all be so wrong about something, even though we are so convinced we are right. 
We may even think we know better than God at times. In this, we are no different than the Galatians. Paul had preached Christ crucified, and they had believed and received the Holy Spirit by faith in Christ. But now they were operating as if their works of the law were the the key for their justification and their sanctification. How foolish were they? How foolish are we to ignore God's revealed truth? Paul wasted no time contending for the truth of the Gospels in his letter to the Galatians. He warned them that anyone trying to add or subtract from it is accursed. He then assured them that the gospel was not from man, but came directly from God, arguing that if he were to make up a a message given his credible lineage and reputation as a devout Jew, it wouldn't be one of a crucified Savior whose ransom justifies sinners apart from the law. This is precisely why it is by grace through faith that God saves, so that no one, however wise, powerful, rich, or influential, can can boast and all glory goes to God. How then, though, could, could the Galatian believers be so foolish as to ascribe to the wonder of justification to a consequence of the law after believing their Savior suffered the greatest agony and torment ever known to humankind in order to pay for it. Check out this essential doctrine, special revelation. Special revelation refers to God's revealing himself to humanity through historical events, his word, and through Jesus Christ. Through special revelation, human beings learn about God's character, his will, his purpose for creation, and his plan of redemption. Special revelation shows us the nature and character of God, and because God has revealed himself in this way. We can know him through a saving relationship with him in the person and work of Jesus Christ. You know, the law was and still is an integral part of Jewish history and culture, a blessing from God to the people of Israel and subsequently to the world. To be counted among the people of God in the old covenant required observance of the law, including circumcision of males. Yet some Jews had held this same expectation for those who would become Christians under the new covenant, and the Gentile Galatian believers were being tempted by this false teaching. Now, to counter this, Paul pointed to Abraham, who preceded the law and was found righteous before God on the basis of his faith alone. Aware of the purpose and function of the law, which he addresses later in his letter, Paul appealed to the history and tradition of the Jews to show how the works of the law do not accomplish our salvation, neither for the Jews or Gentiles. Going back beyond the giving of the law, Paul took his readers to the forefather of Israel himself, who came 430 years before the law and therefore could not have been justified by it. So how then did Abraham come to be the father of many nations? How did he become to be justified? Well, he believed what God said, and it was counted to him as righteousness. The believers in Galatia seem to have been confused about the nature of the gospel, as if one's ethnicity or traditions made one superior to others. There seems to be a a similar confusion today. But if God's chosen people were not permitted to tack on extra qualifications for following Christ, how then, much less, uh, any other groups of people? See, there is no specific people group, culture, style of worship, fashion trend, diction, diction or a hairstyle, or, or a preaching tone that identifies one as being closer to God than another. In fact, we reflect the glory of God through our rich cultural backgrounds and by embracing each other's differences. Ultimately, we we must submit all our traditions and differences under God's authority and be unified in our belief that faith in the finished work of Christ alone can save. You know, why might people be tempted to base their salvation in relationship with God on their obedience to a set of laws? Well, we are prideful and trust ourselves to accomplish what needs to be done for our own salvation. Right? We do, do not trust the grace of, of God to forgive our sins if we 
do not personally atone for them. Maybe they are not aware of the forgiveness of, and salvation freely available in Christ. Or obedience to and meeting expectations maybe is how we almost every other human relationship works in this world. Here's our second point. Faith in Christ, not the law, is what removes the curse of sin. Read with me Galatians chapter 3 verses 10 through 14. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the books of the law, and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on the tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. The all-or-nothing concept is often referenced in sports training as, as a mantra for working hard. Right? Dieting fads have also promoted this approach as a necessary for losing weight. But this concept has never been more true than when used to describe the relationship between sinners and the Mosaic law. The law of God depicts holiness, perfect obedience as its standard of righteousness. And to fall short puts us under the law's curse for lawbreakers' death. Right? Paul stressed to the Galatians that, that even the Jews, God's chosen people, stood condemned by the law because they could not keep it perfectly. Both Jew and Gentiles alike are, are condemned under the weight of their sin, and no one is righteous or seeks after God. Right? Our sin levels the playing field. No one is better than anyone else. We are all equal in what we were created by God in his image to glorify him. And we have all rebelled against this purpose and become God's enemies because of our sin. Comparing ourselves to others might be reassuring. We can also find comfort in our own good works. But the problem is, is that the standard isn't another human being or our own performance. No, the standard is perfection the righteousness of our holy creator. When measured against him, we fall short every time. Right? What are some ways you know, people object to God's standard of perfection and, and the curse of, for, of death for those who, who fall short? I want surely God grades on a curve, right? So that because I'm better than so-and-so, maybe as, so as long as my good deeds outweigh my evil deeds, I'm sure that God will accept me. Or here's one, to hold someone uh, to, to perfection is unfair because no one is perfect. Or God must be using hyperbole when he says sin earns death because that's just too harsh of a punishment for my mistakes. You know, the only reason salvation is a free gift, much less possible for those who believe, is because it cost Christ everything. The law that condemns us because we have failed to uphold it perfectly, he fulfilled. Therefore, only he could remove the curse of sin from us. And he did so by becoming the curse for sin as our substitute when he was crucified on a wooden cross. Check out this quote. Through the work of Christ in atonement, justice is not violated but satisfied when God spares a sinner. The just penalty for sin was exacted when Christ, our substitute, died for us on the cross. However unpleasant this may sound to the ear of the natural man, it has never been, it is ever been sweet to the ear of faith. You know, the agony and torment that Christ endured on the cross is beyond human comprehension or comparison. In our place, Jesus bore the full weight of God's wrath for sin. And in exchange, believers get the righteousness of his perfect, sinless life and is in right standing with God. He died our death and rose again, defeating death forever and granting us eternal life if we repent and believe in him. 
The constant pressure in society to base our happiness on how many things we can acquire causes us to miss the things in life that actually matter. In the thick of everyday life, workplace drama, housework, playdates, deadlines, meal prep finances, you get it. It's frightening how our identity as a children of the almighty God of the universe can become just another entry on that list. We would do well to labor to remember the cost of our saving grace. For we were ransomed and not with perishable things, ever as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Check out this essential doctrine, imputation. When God pardoned sinners at the cross, our sins were imputed or transferred to Christ, who became a sin on our behalf. Our sin was imputed to Christ, and, and Christ's righteousness was imputed to us. When God the Father looks at, at those who have trusted in Christ, he does not see their sins, but their righteousness of Christ as belonging to them. Here's our last point. Faith in Christ, not the law, is what frees us from the bondage of sin. Read with me Galatians chapter 3, verses 21 through 26. Is the law then contrary to the promise of, of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Since the law cannot save, and in fact curses sinners, the natural human response would be to forsake it altogether as outdated and restrictive. But the law itself is not contrary to God's promises. It works in conjunction with them. See, Jesus solidified this when he stated that he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Therefore, we shouldn't look to the law for salvation, but neither should we cast it off. Rather, we should use the law according to its ultimate purpose, to point us to our need for Christ to save us. Although it may seem cruel at first glance, we can't ignore the fact that the fundamental objection of the law was to confine us, to imprison us under sin's power. The vast majority of, of people don't view themselves as being in bondage to sin. Such a concept seems extreme. But we're filled up with impatience, selfishness, lust, contempt, jealousy, and ungratefulness. And, and that's all before lunchtime. We tend to overlook our sin, laughing it off because, you know, we're all human. But we forget that God is holy and divine, and he is not pleased with sin. The law makes clear our condition. We are sinners through and through, and we have no hope of atonement or salvation on our own. The indictment of the law curses us as sinners, but it also primes us. By in imprisoning us under the power of sin, the law guides us to the end of ourselves, teaching us that only Christ can justify and save us. You know, what are some ways that the law points us to Jesus? Well, it reveals the depth of our sin because we cannot keep the law, even if we wanted to, which we don't. The Old Testament sacrifices pointed forward to the once-for-all sacrifice Jesus made of himself. The high priest of the Old Covenant foreshadowed Jesus, our great high priest. And in the tabernacle foreshadowed the day when God would dwell with his physically in his incarnate son. You know, only in Christ can people truly find themselves because sin has marred our humanity. Whether we have the law or not, we are already imprisoned under sin. The commands of the law make us make this plain to us because we rebel against them again and again. Only through faith in Christ can we regain wholeness as image bearers of God and freedom from the bondage of sin. 
When we come to faith in Christ, we are free from sin and bound to Jesus in Christ. We are no longer enemies of God, but his adopted sons and daughters. And we are directed by the Holy Spirit to resist sin and pursue the righteousness that comes by faith. The all-knowing, all-powerful God who created the universe cannot overlook wrongdoing. No, he is holy, and he must judge and punish wickedness. Yet God proved his love for us that, and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And having been justified by Jesus' blood, we are welcomed into God's family and called to be holy as God is holy. This is not referring to a legalistic holiness based on obedience to the Mosaic law, which Paul argued against in his letter to the Galatians. No, this holiness is a spirit-filled life of ongoing repentance and abiding in Jesus, living out of the righteousness we have received through faith in Christ. Freedom from sin also needs to be understood as freedom from the darkness and shame it produces. While on this earth, we must still fight against our sinful desires, but we now have the Spirit-empowered freedom to fight. Ultimately, sin no longer has any power over us because we belong to Christ. In In Him, there is no condemnation. Our consciences are purified, and we are new creations. Because of this, As believers, we can confess our sins to one another and pray for one another that we may be healed. It is under this new identity as sons and daughters of of God in Christ Jesus that we display our unified faith in the finished work of Christ, who alone can save. You know, what are some ways believers demonstrate their freedom from sin through faith in Christ? Well, they strive to live with self-control in the power of the Holy Spirit. They regularly repent of the sins they do commit. They confess their sins to other believers for the loving support in the fight against sin. They make wise decisions about the things they watch, the people they entertain, and the places they go. They pray to be delivered from the evil. You know, as believers in Christ, our faith anchors us and binds us to God and, and to one another. Amidst disagreement and debates within the church, absolutely no wiggle room is allowed in the matter of faith in the finished work of Christ as the only means for salvation. This in no way eliminates other worthy discussions, but the truth of the gospel must inform them as their foundation. Our faith must permeate our everyday lives and interactions with others. And having been under the bondage of sin and now tasting of God's saving grace through faith in Christ, we should have an urgency to share this good news with those who are still perishing in their sin. Because Jesus has provided salvation from our sin and given us his righteousness, we proclaim the message of salvation by grace through faith alone. So what are you going to do? in response to God's word. Well, here are some things for you to think about. How will you fight against sin because of the salvation available through faith in Christ? What are some ways your church can help one another to live by faith rather than rely on works? And how will you help unbelievers understand the good news that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone? Check out this quote. No condemnation now I dread. Jesus, in in him all is mine. Alive in him my living head and clothed in righteousness divine. Bold, I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, would die for me? Pray with me. Gracious Father, Thank you for your great kindness to save us through faith alone, in Christ alone. Forgive us for the times we think we deserve your grace or when we think we grow through the exercise of our own strength. Remind us afresh each day that we are your children because of your grace, the work of your Son, and the work of your Spirit. And may we live out the righteousness that Christ has won for us as we live on his mission for his name and his glory. Amen.
Thanks for watching this episode of Through the Word. Paul wrote to the church in Galatia to remind them that faith, not works, is the foundation of the gospel. Through the completed work of Jesus, living a sinless life, dying to pay for sin, and rising again in new life, we can be saved solely by faith, grace through faith. Hey, can I share with you some good news? It's this, that Jesus came to live the perfect sinless life that you could not live. He died the sinner's death that you deserve, but he defeated both sin and death by rising from the grave. You can be saved from your sins by putting your faith and trust in Jesus. Are you ready to give your life to him? If so, would you pray this prayer with me? You're going to find the words right here on the screen. Dear God, I am a sinner and I want to be forgiven. I believe Jesus Christ, your son, died for my sins and is alive right now. I turn away from my sin and now confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and receive him into my life. I ask you, Lord Jesus, to control my life and I thank you for giving me eternal life. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, would you reach out to me? Maybe you have some questions about what it means to follow Jesus. Hey, get in touch. Go to our website at cbcmaysville.com forward slash connect because I want to connect with you, to send you some free resources to help you to know what it looks like to follow Jesus. And if you enjoyed this episode, would you please share it so that others can experience God's Word? Next week's episode of Through the Word is titled, The Church is United in Hope. We will see that Christ's imminent return is the hope of the church and the motivation to live with faith and love. Well, Lord willing, I will see you next Thursday for Through the Word. Until then, God bless.